I now understand that I acted in a way that made people feel uncomfortable. It was unintentional, and I truly and deeply apologize for it. Uh, I'm not going to resign. Uh, I work for the people of the state of New York. They elected me. Governor Cuomo, mired in a sex harassment scandal, apologizes, shows contrition, backs an investigation, but by midweek was still refusing to resign. I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. This is Cuomo's third term as governor and he's never been in political hot water the way he is now. That water is now at full boil. State Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins called on him to resign, quote, for the good of the state. That bruising review came on the heels of at least five women very publicly accusing Cuomo of sexual harassment, including an unwanted advance at a wedding with a record case. State Attorney General Letitia James is overseeing the investigation into the allegations. Cuomo discovers Me Too means him too, is the way it was headlined in last Sunday's column from Maureen Dowd in the Times. If all that wasn't bad enough, the Times reported that top Cuomo aides rewrote a nursing home report to cover up a higher death toll in the homes during the pandemic. And does all that mean that Cuomo is losing his grip on power in New York? We're joined by Jesse McKinley, the Albany Bureau Chief of the New York Times, and Dana Rubenstein, Metro Political Reporter for the Times. Jesse, walk us through this now. While you compare this to the problems that uh, Elliot Spitzer faced when he was the governor, Elliot Spitzer, you pointed out, had no friends in government. Therefore, he was not faced with much choice and pretty much had to resign. Uh, Andrew Cuomo, you said, has some friends. Uh, that was a while ago. Does he still have some friends? Is he holding on to those friends? And are th those friends going to be enough to allow him to hold on to office? Well, I, I think his best friend right now is Carl Hasty, who is the leader of the state assembly, who has not called for his resignation. As you pointed out, Andrea Stewart Cousins, who runs the, uh, the state senate, has called for resignation. And the assembly right now appears to be kind of the bulwark, which is uh, preventing, you, you know, impeachment proceedings from beginning. Uh, you know, a collection of female lawmakers in that house actually came forward a couple of days ago and said that the uh, process should work itself out, that the investigation should be completed. So there's a lot of pressure and yet not kind of a, you know, definitive blow against the governor at this point. Now, that being said, things seem to be getting worse for him day by day. You know, the calls for resignation continue to come out. A couple of days ago, Dick Gottfried, who's the longest serving member of the state assembly, the entire state legislature, you know, a 40 year veteran, said the time has come for the governor to go. So one by one, piece by piece, blow by blow, cut by cut, uh, the governor's position and his political standing is weakening. Dana, apart from the substantive uh, evidence behind all this, and that obviously is still being investigated, who benefits from this politically? Obviously, the lieutenant governor would take over, but uh, you have a gloating uh, Mayor de Blasio. You have the Working Families Party that opposed Governor Cuomo. Uh, who would succeed him? Who is waiting in the wings who would benefit if uh, Andrew Cuomo either resigns or, as a result of this, does not uh, go ahead and seek a fourth term? Well, there's several people who are considered potential gubernatorial contenders, including Tish James, Kathy Hochul, uh, some Republican Congress members. Um, but I think a lot of people benefit from him just being in a weakened state, right? The state legislature benefits in, in the upcoming budget negotiations. The mayor benefits. I mean, honestly, it's hard to uh, imagine a time when he seemed happier because the governor has been his perpetual tormentor and now he has become more of a political non-entity than he has been perhaps ever. Well, the mayor is seeming a little too happy actually <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, political etiquette perhaps. Uh, Jesse, walk us through this. If the governor does resign, what happens? 
Well, the, the, the first thing that would happen was Kathy Hochul would become the first female governor of the state of New York, which I think there would probably be some irony noted there in some quarters. You know, Kathy is from Buffalo. She would not necessarily have a, you know, guarantee of being reelected in a in an election in 2022, uh, mainly because her political base is in Western New York and traditionally the power base in the state of New York is the city. So um, I think as Dana mentioned, I think there'd be a little bit of a free for all in democratic circles uh, of potential candidates coming forward to kind of seek that, including Mr. de Blasio himself, who's apparently indicated that he is interested in that job. So with a lot of the Cuomo intrigue, there's the Shakespearean element of inside of this, you know, with his relationship with his father, et cetera. But certainly the idea of Bill de Blasio coming to uh, Albany and and taking the place of his long tormentor, as Dana put it, uh, there is some rich uh, drama in, in, in that concept. Dana, obviously uh, there's a lot of perspective and context that needs to be applied to this case. Although, of course, more and more uh, evidence coming out, uh, some evidence coming out that the governor uh, or people around him perhaps tried to uh, uh, denigrate uh, some of the people who are making these accusations now. But when is too far too far in what the governor has done? Uh, obviously, times have changed. Uh, there are degrees to what people have done. And tell me why, and I, this is probably a rhetorical question, the governor could not do what Gail Collins suggested in her column and said, you know, it's a tough time right now. Part of it for me is realizing how I can be a jerk with women and times have changed. And could he get away with an excuse like that these days and say, it was stupid, I've learned from it, it'll never happen again. Honestly, that's the question, right? I mean, the governor is very, like many politicians attuned to the polls. So I think he will be very paying very close attention to what the polls say about whether or not he should resign. I think there's also a as he is surely aware, a, a very large generational gap on this question, right? Younger people uh, seem to be the ones calling most um, emphatically for resignation. Older people seem more willing to, you know, see the investigation play out. I mean, his old ally, Nita Lowy, the former Congresswoman just put out a statement to that effect saying she's known him much of, much of his life and she wants to see the investigation play out. So I think, I think he's he's very governed by public opinion. I also think that he is, as I think uh, Charles Barron said recently, it is not in his constitutional makeup to resign, to give up power, right? I just, that's not happening unless something very dramatic happens, you know, unless, I don't know if you agree, Jesse, but unless, you know, Joe Biden calls for his resignation or something like that. Dana, uh, when so many people have called for an investigation, how do they justify asking for his resignation before that due process, before that uh, investigation is completed? Well, I assume they see the investigation as something of a delay tactic. I don't think it would be surprising if the governor himself saw it that way, betting that by the time the investigation concludes, the uh, passions will have cooled and, and his political viability will be enhanced. So um, I, I presume that's the reason they want an immediate resignation. Jesse, let's go back to the substance of the nursing home situation. Uh, that seems to be, you know, in terms of substance, a major issue. Uh, was there a problem not just with the cover-up of those statistics, but was there a causal factor here? Did the state policy actually cause some of those deaths in the nursing homes uh, unnecessarily? You know, I, I think that's the huge question. I, I think that there are arguments to be made both ways. I think, um, you know, even in the report that they apparently deep sixed in order to kind of rewrite and, and negate, you know, these deaths uh, that David Goodman and Danny Hakem got last week in, in their story, even in the original report, it seemed as though their conclusion was going to be that this memo, this controversial memo, which ordered uh, nursing homes to take back COVID positive patients, that that memo was not necessarily uh, the, re, you know, the cause of additional deaths. But I think that sort of the data analysis will go ahead. But I think the larger issue here is a question of what the governor's staff was willing to do in order to maintain his reputation. 
Um, and I think that's the, the troubling element of this is, is that, you know, uh, Danny and David drew the line to him writing his book, which of course, uh, earlier this week, we were also reported has now been basically, you know, back shelved by its publisher. They're not gonna bring it out in paperback. Its sales have basically ground to a halt. But the question becomes, was a public document, you know, an official document basically, uh, you know, altered in order to kind of maintain the governor's reputation at a time in which he was trying to, you know, ride his his reputation as a COVID killer. Mm -hmm. So we shall see. I think there's going to be lines of reporting open on this for months and months to come. Uh, but certainly the admissions by the administration that they did, you know, withhold data. Um, does not help them. And I think particularly at a time in which they need lawmakers not to ask for his resignation, the fact that he has angered so many of his fellow Democrats by his behavior vis-a-vis -vis the nursing home issue does not help him. I'm more concerned, frankly, uh, not whether uh, the cover-up, but uh, why the cover-up and whether uh, uh, there was a deliberate concern that the state policy actually proved to be detrimental. Dana, just uh, in the little time we have left, let's talk about the mayoral race. You had a story about Steve Ross urging people or trying to uh, run a campaign for people to register, to enroll, to vote if they are moderates. How do you find moderates in a mayoral election and get them out to vote? Who's a moderate? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, voter participation, as I think I linked to a story that you wrote actually from several years ago, voter participation in the 2013 primaries was abysmal, right? New York City residents, for whatever reason, don't vote that much in their mayoral primaries. It was like, what was it? 20% of enrolled Democrats and Republicans voted in the 2013 primaries. And, and so I, I assume he is going for the other 80%, uh, perhaps those folks who don't normally participate or who don't know that the primary is in June instead of September or who aren't familiar with many of the policy proposals that Stephen Ross finds objectionable. Um, but how do we know those people will find it objectionable too? I couldn't say what his particular um, uh, calculations are. I will say that um, you know, the candidate with the greatest name recognition right now would presumably benefit the most from a get out the vote effort. And that's Andrew Yang. And Andrew Yang is considered to be a, a candidate that is palatable to the business class. Right. Dana Rubenstein and Jesse McKinley of the New York Times. Thank you for joining us. And coming up next, the GOP versus voting rights. Under Donald Trump, Republicans lost control of the House and Senate, and of course, the White House. Outcomes like that would normally lead to a political party doing an autopsy to try to come up with a strategy to attract more voters. The GOP is doing just the opposite. Their strategy is to make it harder for people to vote. The Times writes, quote, Republicans in the era of former President Donald Trump have made limiting access to voting a key provision of their political identity. Republicans in at least 43 states are trying to roll back laws increasing access to the ballot box that even some of them had once supported. That includes things like limiting early voting, especially on Sundays, cutting voting hours, restricting voting by mail, banning drop boxes for mail ballots, ending automatic voter registration, and more. Those moves would impact voters of color and young people the most, and not coincidentally, more inclined to vote Democratic. There are also a critical voting rights case coming up before the Supreme Court. So what will the impact be of this push for what amounts to voter suppression? We're joined by Mark Leibovich, the chief national correspondent for the New York Times Magazine, and Reed Epstein, political correspondent for the Times. Mark, how do they justify this when we're talking about democracy, we're talking about uh, freedom of, of uh, assembly, we're talking about exercising uh, the rights under the Constitution. How do we explain to people that we're trying to limit their right to vote. What Republicans have done in this 
particular case, certainly in Georgia, but, uh, but really across the country in 43 states, as you mentioned, is they're using terms like, well, we are for election integrity, uh, election transparency, buzzwords like that, which are basically proxies for, hey, you know, we don't think, we think that there's election fraud. And look, there are all these polls that say Republicans don't trust elections. So they think that these elections have been stolen from Republicans. And of course, there is one, no proof of this. And two, um, you know, their standard bearer, Donald Trump, spent several months or has spent several months just sort of yelling and screaming about how the election was stolen from him and there's fraud and, and everything. So naturally, there's going to be a great deal of buy in for that among Republican voters who worship him. And therefore, you have a lot of distrust that's going to be reflected in the polls. What it doesn't reflect is the substance of these actual alleged fraud accusations, which has been, you know, in large part the impetus for a lot of these new um, ballot restriction measures that you're seeing in places like Georgia. Is there any bipartisan effort uh, to investigate whether there was election fraud or not, or what the potential is for it? Certainly plenty of officials, including from the Trump ad administration, have come out and said, no, there was not, at least in this past election. Yeah, I mean, you have everything from, from Bill Barr to the Department of Homeland Security, or former Attorney General Bill, William Barr, the Department of Homeland Security, um, any number of states, attorneys generals and Justice Department officials said there's really nothing there. And, you know, the, the Trump campaign lost pretty much every election challenge they brought in the courts. Um, they have not brought any compelling information on this. So, no, there really hasn't been in efforts to investigate, quote, voter fraud, people have said, Republicans and Democrats who are experts in this field time and again, that it has yielded nothing. So basically what you have is the kind of outcry that has been led by Donald Trump that has obviously stirred up emotions, but again, has not turned up any really hard proof that there's anything going on. Reed, how much of a role is Donald Trump still playing in the party? We read in the Times that Obviously, he's trying to control the fundraising in the party. He spoke to conservatives last week. And now we're seeing defections, maybe not politically, but defections in terms of their employment from the Senate among incumbent Republicans and incumbent Republicans who weren't necessarily elected with or for or by Donald Trump. What does that mean? I mean, a good rule of thumb for what Donald Trump is doing in his post-presidency is that anything that involves any amount of work or financial investment, he's probably not gonna be involved in. He still controls a lot of the small dollar fundraising we've seen in the last several days, uh, this back and forth between him and the major Republican committees over the use of his name in fundraising appeals. And, and we've seen uh, his family, particularly his son, Don, Don Jr., uh, try to insert himself in some of these intramural Republican conflicts, uh, particularly in Wyoming over Liz Cheney. Uh, who was one of the most more prominent House Republicans to vote for impeachment. Uh, but as far as sort of him being involved in the nuts and bolts, uh, it's to be determined how much he's going to actually do. So far, the answer uh, is not much as far as get him getting into the specifics and in the weeds of things. Uh, that's still very much a possibility. We could see him barnstorming, uh, campaigning for for midterm candidates in 2022 or ahead of the 2022 elections. Um, but there isn't any evidence to date uh, that he is in, intimately involved in, in much of the politics of where the party is going. Mark, uh, what about the Joe Biden and his record so far? It's obviously very early. We're not even into the first 100 days, a rather arbitrary measurement. Uh, but uh, in terms of what he's gotten through Congress, in terms of his cabinet nominations that have been ratified, uh, how would you say he is doing? The big part of this is the COVID relief package, 1.9 trillion that, that has passed the, um, the Senate. It's back in the House. It will probably wind up on President Biden's desk later this week. Um, that's a massive triumph. Um, it's, it's, you know, certainly it's only been, it's been less than 100 days, but that is as big a legislative accomplishment as he's had and, you know, really would be over any four-year period. So there's that, and that's going to be a massive, um, you know, execution challenge to actually get that money out, to actually hopefully stimulate the economy in a way that they're saying it will, and also provide relief to a lot of both, you know, uh, people who have been hit in a healthcare and economic way by this um, pandemic. So that, that's the big one. As far as um, getting the nominations through, there have obviously been a few uh, hiccups, like the Neera Tandon uh, Office of 
Madam Budget nominee who did not get through. There was controversy over her old tweets that were too inflammatory for some Republicans and a few Democrats or one Democrat, Joe Manchin. Um, but, you know, Merrick Garland, who's probably, you know, maybe the most prominent or certainly most sort of pivotal cabinet member, the attorney general um, nominee uh, is moving towards, you know, some kind of confirmation. He's not on the job yet, which, you know, has been a source of some concern given that the Department of Justice is, is really got a really full plate right now, uh, you know, including trying to sort of rebuild from a really demoralizing few years under President Trump and, and Attorney General William Barr that, that caused a lot of people to leave the department. So there's a lot of work to do there. But look, I mean, it's it's not an easy thing to start an administration, especially when you don't have the benefit or transition. So um, I would say that the administration is probably pretty happy with how things have started, especially around the COVID relief package no benefit of transition and really a very early start in the administration. But uh, there is a surge or what appears to be a surge growing in terms of uh, distribution of the COVID vaccine. But how much of that is the responsibility uh, is the result of what the Trump administration did as opposed to what the Biden administration is doing? Well, look, I mean, I think we can stipulate that, that presidents and their administrations are always going to probably take too much credit and too much blame for, for various things. I mean, I think it, it's impossible not to credit the, the outgoing or the, the former administration, the Trump administration, for one, overseeing the development or at least the process that led to the development of these vaccines. And, and obviously, there were some things in place to get distribution going uh, before Biden came to the White House. So, look, I'm not sure you're going to hear um, a lot of praise for the Trump efforts on this front from the Biden administration, but I think clearly, um, you know, this occurred during a period of transition and, and, the, and the pandemic obviously overlaps these two presidents in a way that you have to sort of, you know, give credit where it's due. Reed, uh, back to voter rights suppression. What can the Democrats do about this? Uh, are they doing anything in terms of legislation? And is there anything Congress can do? Or is this uh, a state by state battle that the Democrats have to fight? Well, the House has passed a major voting infrastructure bill called H.R. 1. Uh, they passed it first in the last Congress when Republicans ran the Senate. They passed it again uh, already this year. But it is this sort of legislation that has no hope in the Senate unless uh, there's some sort of an agreement to change how the filibuster works. Uh, this is not a bill that's going to get 60 votes. It will not get 10 votes from Republicans. Uh, it may not get any votes from Republicans. Uh, and so it to become to have this bill come into law, Democrats will need to figure out a way uh, to convince the likes of Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, uh, senators from West Virginia and Arizona, who have publicly been dead set against uh, any pushing through anything uh, that alters how many votes bills need to pass uh, to, to make that into law. That's really the only hope short of a patchwork series of, of lawsuits against some of these bills that we've seen from Democratic lawyers uh, to, to halt what Republicans are doing. Short of that, I think what, what Mark said is, is right. We're going to see states, uh, Iowa, Georgia, Florida, and elsewhere uh, enact significant restrictions on act the access to vote ahead of the, the 2022 midterm elections and the 2024 presidential election. And that will mean things like limited hours of voting, a shorter window for early voting, making it much harder to vote by mail or drop a ballot off, uh, and, and more stricter requirements for a voter showing identification to vote. Uh, and that is something that is going to require or would require a federal response to halt it because a lot of these states are controlled by Republican lawmakers and Republican governors. Speaking of a federal response, Mark, uh, will we have anything left of the Voting Rights Act after this Supreme Court term? I mean, you know, I'm not, I don't really know. I mean, obviously we'll see what the court says, but uh, look, I mean, there's been an erosion of, of this uh, for a long time over a you know, pretty pretty substantial period of months and judges at this point. So, I mean, I guess we'll see. I mean, I, there, the court has obviously surprised on this issue before, but it's also been pretty consistent in sort of eroding this to a point where state legislatures feel like they are freer to act and, you know, do things that the critics say are, are just draconian efforts to thwart voters. 
Reed, it's hard to believe we're thinking of another election cycle, but very quickly, how are the Democrats looking at 2022 and holding on to the House and the Senate? Uh, well, the Senate, there's now been five Republican senators that announced they won't seek re-election. Uh, several of them in states that uh, will be competitive in, in Pennsylvania and North Carolina. Uh, this week, Roy Blunt of Missouri announced he won't run again. That one is probably le uh, a bigger reach for Democrats, even with an open seat. And so Democrats are, are feeling more and more optimistic that they'll hold a Senate majority and perhaps even expand it. Uh, the House is really up in the air. Uh, you know, we just have no idea what the district lines are going to look like. We won't know for several more months uh, because of the delay in, in the census, processing the census data. But of course, like, that's going to be up to those state legislatures, which are pretty much in Republican hands. Right. And that and Republican state legislatures in Georgia, Florida and Texas are the same legislators that are uh, this month enacting restrictions on voting are going to have control of the pens to draw the new district lines. And so Republicans are very optimistic that they will be able to take a House majority uh, purely on redistricted lines alone. Uh, Democrats expect that they will have legal fights and pressure campaigns on redistricting uh, in the latter half of this year. And again, that yeah. the redistricting piece is also a part of the, the HR1 legislation that, right. they, that House Democrats have already passed. Well, we'll see how that goes. Reed Epstein, Mark Leibovich of the New York Times, thank you for joining us. And for the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.